You're casting Splash today. Who plays Tom Hanks's role? My name is... I'm actually gonna do Splash today and I can't say. Wait, wait what? I'm actually going to do it um, from the point of view of... Uh, I can't say anything about it. It's a, there's a movie star involved or really? gonna be involved. I haven't announced it. Now in your book you say your original take on it yeah. was called Wet. Yeah. And it was written from the point of view of the mermaid. Yes. And that's what we're, we're going to do a version of that. But I can't tell you the twist. Sort of Has Hollywood reversed that at all? No, Hollywood hasn't reversed that. You mean, doing the, the quality tour de force movie that is between 30 and 50 million dollars, not really. Actually, Amazon does a version of that. I mean, Amazon could do a King's Speech, or Amazon would have done a Beautiful Mind, or Amazon, so I mean, it's not like I'm selling Amazon. <laughs> I do love Jeff Bezos, he's a brilliant guy. But when you mention Amazon, I mean, that's a studio that's been around for Five minutes, right? I mean, <laughs> well, I, did Hollywood years, cede think. that ground? Did Amazon take it? Is what's the level of disruption? I think I think it's well the level of disruption in that exact situation. It was, I think, less about disruption and just more about those movies were not working within the financial paradigms that conventional Hollywood studios were doing. Television is the place for character-driven drama entertainment. That sensibility is going to television, and as I said, uh, Amazon is also a good home for that. This is a quote from Jodie Foster at Cannes. She's talking okay. about Taxi Driver. I tried to get into your cab one night, and now you want to come and take me away. Couldn't be made today, financed by a major studio, and that's okay. I just want to make movies, so I'm happy to do them on my iPhone. <laughs> Can okay. you think of examples, films you once made that couldn't be done today by a major studio? I have a few films that I've made that probably wouldn't be done for a major, on a major, um, like I produced a movie called Inside Man that actually Jodie Foster was in, along with Denzel Washington and Clive Owen and Spike Lee directed it. I mean, unless there was some real evidence, I don't think a studio would make it. Studios are, a, are like the, they're a bell curve, you know, and, and it has its own sort of mathematical premise to them. And they try not to violate those paradigms. So has your interest in working with them sort of waned as, as televisions come along? Yeah, because televisions come along and so I've refocused my energy and that's all we have is time, energy, focus and intellect. And I've <laughs> used that and applied it to television. I still this year did make four movies, but they can't happen in a rushed timeline like they did in the 90s or year two or, or, or 2000. Where you that, were doing one, two movies a year, every year. Yeah, well, well it's just like the, it's the business part. If this is a business show, the business has changed in the movie, in the movie business. Where the uh, power dynamics, people that make those decisions, have been amortized over 12 people. Whereas in the 90s, it was one person that would decide. So 12 people makes it 12 times longer. <laughs> and who needs that headache? When you have yeah. networks or platforms saying, not only will we make this simple, but you can do whatever you want, right? right. You don't have to worry about notes. Right. I mean, it's yours, go. In some cases, you don't have to worry about notes at all. I mean, Netflix, they don't really give notes, and they're doing pretty well. They don't give you ratings, do they? Uh, no. Does that, does that bother you? No, I love it. You do? You love it, yeah. How do you judge? Artists love it. Well, you don't have to. You can just, that's the beauty of it. You're not compared, you're not publicly compared. It's, there's no humiliation in it. So artists get to take creative risks. There are some movies that just have to be theatrical films. And then you just have to have patience. You know, they'll take, okay, I'm producing a movie with Ron Howard actually, that's, uh, that's Stephen King's Dark Tower. We've worked on this 10 years. It's finally getting made in South Africa, in Cape Town. 
with Idris Alba and with Matthew McConaughey. It's a great cast, but it took over 10 years. And you were not willing to have it be seen anywhere but a theater? Yeah, in that case, yes. Now, we're going to actually do that movie on multiple platforms. We're going to have, it's going to have a theatrical release, and we have a really two sexy guys that will blow that up. <laughs> and then we're going to have, it'll be on a, a television platform as well. Wow. So, and I think multiple platforms, here's the things, that the phrases that I think matter now. Multiple platforms. You're right. It's simultaneous? Uh, they can be simultaneous or sequential. Okay. And I think life cycles. So life cycles mean I produced the movie Friday Night Lights. It then had a life cycle in television. Clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. Can't lose. Now we're doing it again as Friday Night Lights, today, 2016, in another small town in Texas. And then probably it will then produce another series. It can just go from lily pad to lily pad, essentially, skipping along this. Yeah, this I mean, Star George Lucas kind of started it with Star Wars. It was a myth created this brilliant movie, Star Wars, that had more Star Wars, and then proliferated into other things, um, either hardware, you know, like think toys and things to buy, or other software. And now it's been, as you know, repurchased by Disney, and it's going to have many, many, many lives because that, that new Star Wars was so successful. People think of you as a film producer, but then we also know about... So, I mean, Sports Night was 18 years ago, right? Yeah, exactly. Aaron, Aaron Sorkin. We started Aaron Sorkin. So has your view of broadcast changed since then? Yes, my view of broadcast has changed. Actually, broadcast television, um, the limitation, creative limitations have expanded. I mean, you can see this on our show, Empire. We did what we had to do. Damn right. I mean, Empire pushes those boundaries about as far as any kind of broadcast television show could push it. In terms of language, subject matter, dancing, sexuality, the soap opera component, I mean it has, um, it pushes the boundaries as far as you can push it. But I think network, there's, there's a reason for network programming. Network programming, when it really works, is the most remunerative form of television. Meaning you get, you make, you get paid the most amount of money. <laughs> Because what happens is it could go, you do enough episodes, it goes into syndication, and then, and then it has all these other sort of ancillary values, like airplanes, whatever the, there's, there's so many different financial and, and content corridors that when you have high quality content, it goes into all those corridors and creates all those income streams. And, and it's worth it to operate within those creative walls because of those economics? As long as it's authentic. In other words, if you look at CBS, there's a lot of constraints on what creatively what you do on CBS, but it completely, absolutely conforms to their viewership. And that's why they're just killing it year after year after year. Les Moonves is a really, really smart guy. I mean, he continually satisfies his customer. And that's ultimately what you're trying to do. Do actors come to you or when you, when you sign them and they say, I really want to work with you, Brian, but... I don't want to be seen on Hulu. Is that, are they beginning to think about that? Um, I'll tell you what happened. Yes, but I think the timeline went like this. It went kind of like, first, actors didn't want to do television. Then they, then they started to do television. Then they did network television and they became like Gary Sinise um, from Ransom on our movie to like being a superstar in television, getting paid a ton of money, and he started to like it. Then. Actors said, you know, I think I only want to be on cable. And then they started to go to cable, HBO and Showtime. Then they start, it it's beca becomes less stigmatizing. And so they're, then they started to say, well, I think I'll be on Netflix. I think I'll be on Amazon. <laughs> Endless amount of things. Do you sometimes think that we are losing that, that water cooler moment, the one show we can all discuss on a Sunday that's not the uh, Super Bowl? No, I don't think we're losing that. It's changed. When you, you asked, do, how, do, how do I view the water cooler moment and is it vaporizing in the world of television? I think it's really changing, like it's floating in that sense. And the water cooler moment that I think you're, trying, that you're defining is that talked about thing, the twittered about thing. Like our show Empire is the most tweeted show right now in the history of television. I know because so, half of those tweets come from my house. <laughs> that, that's cool. <laughs> I, I think what happens is you have to have a lot of anticipation to produce a lot of social media or 
or that water cooler thing. And so because I don't know if binge viewing does that exactly. Binge viewing does a different thing and has tremendous has a tremendous impact on the culture. Um, but I'm not positive because you can watch it all at one time. I think anticipation and those awe moments um, or cliffhanger moments. Cliffhangers like we did on 24. The cliffhanger thing produces a lot of social media. Yeah. And, which is the water cooler thing right. you're saying. And bingeability, because you want to see it resolved. Yeah, you want to see it resolved, but I don't know, I don't really know when you watch 10 episodes all at once what happens. I think I, I, I know the metrics of what happens when you watch a show from week to week. What, you know, like, because you have to wait for the next one. Right. And that produces conversation, because it's unavailable. But 24 seems like the natural binge view. Well, it became it's an that. hour by hour. No, I want you to send me a smaller team to my location. Yes, but it became that. Of course, people couldn't get those DVDs for a couple of years. You've done 8 Mile, which yeah. is essentially a biopic. Yes. The Doors biopic. Yes. Which current star's life would you like to take to the big screen? The Pope. The Pope. Pope Francis. Yeah. You did Frost Nixon. What will President Trump's Frost Nixon movie look like 40 oh years from God. now? Oh, my God. I can't talk about it. I don't know. It's beyond, it's beyond me. You once tweeted. The comedy. You once tweeted, I vote Disney's Bob Iger for president. You stand by that? Yeah. Why would he make such a good president? Incredibly capable, impeccable uh, character. What do you binge watch? I binge watched uh, OJ, and I'm binge watching the, C, uh, the ESPN OJ. They did, there's two different OJs, mm -hmm. and they both were awesome, and I binge watched both of them. House of Cards. I think it's a great show, brilliant show. Some of the people you've interviewed. Okay. Um, the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear their name. Jeff Bezos. Brilliant. Uh, Tim and Cook. And funny. Funny. Brilliant T and funny. Tim Cook. Sincere and honorable. Jack Dorsey. Smart and much funnier than people think he is. Oprah. Oprah is the gr greatest, one of the greatest human beings on the planet. Jim Cramer. Smart, but just out of his mind. <laughs> Hey CNBC fans, I'm Carl Quintanilla. Thanks for watching CNBC's Binge on YouTube. You can subscribe by clicking right here. Watch all of our interviews on the changing media landscape. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch more from CNBC. Thanks for watching.